Serving the Central Coast for over 25 years. I'd like to welcome you back to the show. It's always a pleasure and an honor to have our friend Timothy Sandifer back with us. He's Vice President for Litigation at the Goldwater Institute's Sharf Norton Center for Constitutional Litigation. He holds the Duncan Chair in Constitutional Government. He litigates uh, important cases for economic liberty, private property rights, free speech, and other matters in states across the land. He's an adjunct scholar with the Cato Institute. He's written several books, and we always love having him on the show. Timothy, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. So um, this next case, we, you and I talked about this, I don't know, a year or so ago. Heartbreaking issue. Um, it has to do with at-risk Native children, Native American children. And I'd like you to explain again how you became involved in this and, and give us the good news that the Supreme Court's going to take a look at this. That's right. The Supreme Court announced on Monday that it's going to review the constitutionality of this law called the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a federal law that sets the terms for when state child protection officers can rescue abused or neglected Indian children. And it also sets the rules for foster care and adoption for Indian children. Now, it does not apply on reservations. We're talking about children who live off reservations in residential neighborhoods like you and me. And we're not talking about kids who are members of Indian tribes. They, they are included in this law. But the law also applies to children who are eligible for membership in an Indian tribe. That's the term that the law uses. And of course, that means purely based on their biological ancestry. A child is deemed Indian under this law, even if that child never actually becomes a member of an Indian tribe. And the reason this law is a problem is because the rules that it sets for child protection and adoption and foster care are actually less protective of the child than the laws that apply to every other racial group. It's really quite scandalous. How did you get involved in it? Well, uh, the Goldwater Institute has been working on this project actually since before I even started working at the Goldwater Institute. We, about seven years ago, um, we had a number of people on staff who were themselves foster parents. And when you become a foster parent, you go through training. And part of the training was teaching people about this law. And they were just so shocked at how it could possibly be that federal law actually deprives a racial group of children of the legal protections that all other racial groups enjoy, and particularly Native American kids who are the most at-risk demographic in the country. Native American children are at a greater risk of everything from abuse and molestation to drug abuse, gang membership, and suicide than any other demographic in the country. And yet federal law actually takes away the legal protections, for example, by overriding the best interest of the child rule, which is the rule that applies in child safety with regard to all other races of kids. That rule doesn't apply to Indian children under this law. And I think that's unconstitutional. And so we're really glad that the Supreme Court has agreed to take up this issue. So there is some heartbreaking uh, statistics among Native Americans. As you as you said, it, it's got the sorriest demographics of any um, group, ethnic group in America. And oh, yes. has, has, for instance, in our region, you know, I've been told some really hard stories about, for instance, some of the Native Americans in our region, but then they got a casino and they've got health care and housing and uh, college uh, scholarships for their kids has, has that helped ameliorate this, at least in certain locales? Do you have any oh, yes. idea? In, in some places, yes. But, you know, not all tribes are fortunate enough to have that kind of income. For one thing, a lot of tribes are located so far out in the middle of nowhere that, that you they don't get a lot of traffic going by their land anyway, so a, ca a casino wouldn't be profitable. But, yes, that has been a real help for tribes. But unfortunately, it's just not enough. One, one problem when you're talking about reservations, one of the big problems on reservation land is that you really can't own land on a reservation. The, the land is owned by the federal government in trust for the tribal governments. 
which means that an individual can't own the land, which means you can't get a mortgage on the land, which means you can't raise money for a small business, which means that there's no economic opportunity there. And so you have lots of, of reasons why you have uh, really crippled the economies of reservations. Now, ICWA does not apply on reservations. ICWA, this, this, federal, this federal law that we've been talking about, it applies to children off, who live off reservations. And so there's these weird circumstances. So we did a case a couple of years ago here in Arizona where um, this Native American mother, she was a member of the Tohono O'odham tribe that's in southern Arizona, but she did not live on the reservation. She wanted to terminate the rights of her abusive ex-husband so that her new husband could legally adopt her son. And had, she, had the child been white or black or Asian or Hispanic, then Arizona state law would have applied. And if she had lived on reservation, then the tribe's law would have applied. And it turns out tribal law and Arizona state law are the same with regard to terminating the rights of an abusive parent. But ICWA, this federal law, is what applied to her because she didn't live on a reservation and because the child was an Indian child. And under this federal law, under ICWA, it makes it much, much harder, in fact, prohibitively difficult, to terminate the rights of an abusive parent, even if the birth mother wants to do that. And so what you find is case after case where parents are, Native American parents are trying to protect their kids against potential violence, and this law prohibits them from doing that. So one of the things that you've, you've said is that way back when, um, pr previously, state governments were sometimes taking these children from Indian parents without good reason. And this law maybe was originally meant to do good, but it went way overboard. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, what happened was in the, in the era, particularly leading up to the 1950s or so, there was a policy of, of forced assimilation to try, and, uh, try and, and reduce the power of tribes, even to eliminate tribes entirely, and to take Indian children away and put them in white families. And a lot, some of this, you know, in some places it was driven by pure out-and-out -out racism, and other places it was led by just misunderstandings, people who didn't understand the culture of tribes, and when they looked at how tribes operated, they thought that it was, you know, bad for the kids, when it may not have been. And so the idea behind this law was to try and prevent that. I mean, it, was, it had the best of intentions. It was, we're going to protect these kids from having from being taken away from their parents illegitimately. The problem was that it raised these barriers, these legal barriers that make it so hard to take a child away from a family that even when the child is being abused, states are forced to send children back to homes that they know are abusive. And so we have these horrible horrifying cases where the state knows a household is dangerous and is forced to send these children back and the children end up being murdered. This happened in, uh, there's a case just recently here in Arizona, a child named Josiah Gishi, who was taken from uh, her, his birth mother, who was unable to take care of him. But because of this law, the, the officers were required to return the child to her care. She then left the house without, uh, uh, just left him alone in the house. When she came back, he was dead. There have been cases where children have been sent back to violent homes. The Declan Stewart case in Oklahoma, the Anthony Renova case in Montana, these horrifying cases where the state knows these children are being beaten, and yet ICWA requires that they be sent back to these homes where they are sometimes beaten to death. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to continue our conversation with Timothy Sandifer, Vice President of Litigation at the Goldwater Institute. You're listening to The Andy Caldwell Show. Stay tuned. It's The Andy Caldwell Show, brought to you by COLA. I'd like to welcome you back to the show. My guest, Timothy Sandifer, Vice President of Litigation at the Goldwater Institute. We're talking about a law that went awry. Um, there, in the old days, the bad old days, um, governments used to force children out of Native American homes, uh, ostensibly for something better, to force assimilation and the like. And so a law was created, a federal law that prevented the states from doing that and set the bar so high for removing a kid from their home that now kids that are subject to abuse up into including murder, um, efforts to get them out of there failed. And the United States Supreme Court is going to be hearing this case on this law coming up. Timothy, welcome back to the show. Thank you. 
So, you know, I'm always curious as to, I understand uh, this issue that they can't own land uh, on the reservation. I understand that uh, the American government really screwed most all of these Indian tribes and gave them the worst land they could find as their reservation. I, you know, the San Inez Band of Shumash Indians, which are dear friends of mine, um, they got, they, they're in the San Inez Valley, which is pretty good property, right? But they gave them, they gave them a ravine. <laughs> their, their, yeah. their reservation straddles a ravine. And they didn't have like electricity and other things in that until I don't know how long, not that long ago. Um, and anyway, they, they built a casino and they're doing quite well now. But I've been out in the, in the middle of New Mexico and Arizona and even Nevada where some of these reservations are. You'd be hard pressed to grow a cactus. Yeah, well, that's true. Although, you know, it, well, and, and plus that, uh, on top of that, anytime something valuable is found on tribal land, very often the government come along and say, well, we're gonna, now we're going to move you over this other place instead, yes. you know. Yes. But uh, although that is true, it's also true that some of the nations, uh, or some of the reservations contain some of the, this country's most beautiful ter- tourist destinations. Um, uh, Monument Valley on the Navajo Reservation, for example, which is a huge tourist draw. And the, the unfortunate thing is that, that uh, Native Americans living on these reservations cannot really obtain the kind of financial benefit from that that you might otherwise because they can't own the land and because the tribal government and the federal government exercise so much control over what happens on this property that, you know, there's a, an, an economist who I was reading about this recently who says that it maximizes political control over the economy on tribal lands, and that's exactly right. What what Indians need is the same thing that everything everybody else needs, which is free markets, private property rights, economic liberty, and Native Americans have been denied that a lot of the time on the theory that oh no, capitalism and free markets that's not the Indian way of life, you know, which is nonsense. The, you know, everybody wants to trade and improve their economic station in life, and yet we often have this, you know, it reaches back to the noble savage notions of the 18th century. This this bizarre idea that that free markets and economic opportunity are just somehow, you know racially not Indian or something, and it's just nonsense. But that, unfortunately, is federal policy. And why can't that be changed in the year 2022? Well, I think a large part of it is cultural attitudes, not only among whites, by the way, but also among natives themselves, many of whom buy into this myth that, for example, private property rights are somehow not the Indian way. The idea that that Native Americans didn't understand the idea of private property, you'll find that nonsense in textbooks nowadays. And it's its ridiculous. Of course they understood private property rights. The idea that Indians don't understand property rights was imposed on Indians by white settlers as an excuse for taking their property away. And yet, unfortunately, a lot of loud political activists today on the left embrace this nonsense. Now, of course, this is all kind of far afield of ICWA, which doesn't, you know, the, the Indian Child Welfare Act doesn't really depend on these things, but it's kind of indicative of the way that our cultural attitudes have perpetuated injustices, often in the, in the name of so-called helping the Indians. I mean, ICWA was supposed to be helping Indian children, but what it actually does is take away the legal protections that, that Indian children need and imposes on them this racist notion that Indian children should always be with Indian adults. This is another aspect of the law we didn't mention. The the Indian Child Welfare Act says that if an Indian child is going to be put in foster care or or be adopted, the child must be adopted or put in foster care with other Indian families instead of white or black or Asian or Hispanic families, regardless of tribe, which means that if a child is in Navajo, then the child has to be adopted by a Seminole or a Penobscot family, even though these tribes have virtually nothing in common. They're fa- separated by thousands of miles and, and all sorts of different cultural differences. But the, the, they, they have to be adopted by those families instead of by a white or black or Asian or Hispanic family. And the reason why is because this law is, is based on this idea that Indians are just a separate group of people. And that's wrong. Native Americans 
are citizens of the United States. They have been for a century now, and they deserve the equal protection of the laws. All right. So one of my pet peeves with conservative majorities on the Supreme Court is, you know, their strength is their weakness. They don't want to legislate from the bench. So therefore, they normally narrowly prescribe their decisions. What is this case really about in terms of what can you hope for uh, via the Supreme Court decision? Well, there's two issues, really, in this lawsuit. We've been talking about how it treats different races differently, but there's another aspect of it, too, which is that this is law that says the federal government's coming in and forcing states to do things when it comes to uh, enforcement of you know, child safety law or adoption or foster care, which are supposed to be matters for the states to deal with. And this law comes along and tells states what they can do. In fact, this law is unique in that it is the only federal law on the book that is only ever enforced by state officials. But it's not, that's unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has made clear that the federal government cannot require state officials to enforce federal law. That's called the anti-commandeering doctrine, and it's very dear to the hearts of conservative Supreme Court justices. So my view is, I think, as, even if you lay aside this controversy about racial differences, this, this fact that this law violates that anti-commandeering law, that should be enough reason alone for the Supreme Court to declare it unconstitutional and, and for the conservative justices to treat it very skeptically. I'm optimistic. I think that this law has proven itself a failure so consistently and is so obviously contrary to so much of the Constitution that I think it's a real uphill battle for defenders of the status quo. And I, I think the Supreme Court is going to see through these arguments and see why this law needs to be struck down for the benefit of these Indian children. So I know when you go to court, you typically uh, argue the law. But like, for instance, that case of the child that got forced back into a horrific situation and ends up getting murdered. Can, can lawyers submit that kind of evidence uh, to show how bad this is, how wrongly construed this is? Yes. In fact, that's going to be the role that, that I play in the case. So this case is being litigated by some, some friends um, uh, who are in uh, private attorneys, and I will be filing a friend of the court brief to talk about some of these other cases, the cases that I've worked on with the Goldwater Institute. We've litigated cases and participated in cases from you know, Alaska to Ohio to California to Texas, all over the country, and and our brief will will talk about some of these cases that might that the justices might not otherwise be be told about, and that's that is very important because you know when you're talking about child welfare cases, that those cases don't end up in the legal books very often because they are usually decided by trial judges and they're often sealed because they're you know juvenile courts. So it's important for us to be in there and say, here are some other cases. Here is how this law actually works in practice. It really fails these kids. Okay, here's a big question. Are tribes weighing in? Oh, yes, of just about every tribe in the country. And almost all tribes support the Indian Child Welfare Act, and they do so for a couple different reasons. One is just basic misunderstanding. They, a lot of people just aren't familiar with how this law actually works in practice. They, they don't realize how it actually deprives kids of legal protection. But the other reason is because, like all governments, like state governments, like the federal government, tribal governments also are more interested in their own power than in what actually affects the daily lives of citizens. That's just the truth of the bureaucratic mentality. And so tribal governments like ICWA because it gives them a great deal of power. It allows them to override state governments, and it allows them to override parents, including Native American parents themselves, and to dictate where what happens to children. And government officials, whether they're state, federal, or tribal, are always going to try and protect and expand their power. Well, I get back to my other point. I think that, you know, it's one thing to rescue these children. This is like a 911 call to the Supreme Court. Yeah. But the, lo but the long-term solution is to break the cycles of poverty, drug abuse, and dysfunction on yep. these reservations by giving them more self-economic and other forms of self-determination. I totally agree with that. And I think, you know, if I could wave my magic wand, I, my preference would be that tribal governments be treated like states. 
And what that means is, you know, states have a great deal of autonomy. California and Arizona don't don't have the same laws on the books. They run things very differently sometimes, and they're allowed to do that. But in exchange for that, they have to respect the federal constitution, and they they have to respect the individual rights of the people who live there. And the, the same ought to be true of tribal governments. They should have the same degree of autonomy that states have, but they should also be subject to the federal constitution and the Bill of Rights, which they are not currently. And so, uh, with as, as Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility, the same thing should be true when you're talking about tribal governments and every other government. There should be, they should have autonomy in order to do what's best for their people, but also have responsibility to respect individual rights and not discriminate based on race and not take away people's property or, st- or take away their freedom of speech or whatever it might be. Well, we've seen uh, the abuse that's happened. The Shumash, you know, wanted to take a piece of property that uh, was already zoned highway commercial. They didn't own it. I mean, they owned it, but they it wasn't part of the reservation. And people sued them for years and years and years, just trying to create a cultural museum. Um, and then there were other issues as well. And hopefully all that's behind us now. We'll see. But um, we've seen that happen to them. And, hey, I want to thank you for what you're doing and wish you the best of luck before the United States Supreme Court. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me back. All right. We're going to be back with Carol Mahoney. She's a local Central Coast resident trying to help kids vis-a-vis schools in crisis. It all has to do with school choice. We'll be back. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. 